the child up. Her child and Gabriel's. Her children and Gabriel's. Roy, Delilah, Paul. Only John was nameless and a stranger, living unalterable testimony to his mother's days in sin. What happened? Gabriel demanded. He stood, enormous, in the center of the room, his black lunchbox dangling from his hand, staring at the sofa where Roy lay. John stood just before him. It seemed to her astonished vision, just below him, beneath his fist, his heavy shoe. The child stared at the man in fascination and terror. When a girl down home, she had seen rabbits stand so paralyzed before the barking dog. She hurried past Gabriel to the sofa, feeling the weight of Delilah in her arms like the weight of a shield, and stood over Roy, saying, Now, ain't a thing to get upset about, Gabriel. This boy sneaked downstairs while I had my back turned and got himself hurt a little. He's all right now. Roy, as though in confirmation, now opened his eyes and looked gravely at his father. Gabriel dropped his lunchbox with a clatter and knelt by the sofa. How you feel, son? Tell your daddy what happened. Roy opened his mouth to speak and then, relapsing into panic, <coughs> began to cry. His father held him by the shoulder. You don't want to cry? Use daddy's little man. Tell your daddy what happened. He went downstairs, said Elizabeth where he didn't have no business to be and got to fighting with them bad boys playing on the rock pile. That's what happened, and it's a mercy it weren't nothing worse. He looked up at her. Can't you let this boy answer me for himself? Ignoring this, she went on more gently. He got cut on the forehead, but it ain't nothing to worry about. You call a doctor? How you know it ain't nothing to worry about? Is you got money to be thrown away on doctors? No, I ain't called no doctor. Ain't nothing wrong with my eyes that I can't tell whether he's hurt bad or not. He got a fright more than anything else, and you ought to pray God it teaches him a lesson. You got a lot to say now, he said, but I have me something to say in a minute. I would want to know when all this happened, what you was doing with your eyes then. He turned back to Roy, who had lain quietly sobbing, eyes wide open and body held rigid, and who now, at his father's touch, remembered the height, the sharp sliding rock beneath his feet, the sun, the explosion of the sun his plunge into darkness and his salty blood, and recoiled, beginning to scream as his father touched his forehead. Hold still, hold still, crooned his father, shaking. Hold still, don't cry. Daddy ain't gonna hurt you. He just wants to see this bandage, see what they've done to his little man. But Roy continued to scream and would not be still, and Gabriel dared not lift the bandage for fear of hurting him more. And he looked at Elizabeth in fury. Can't you put that child down and help me with this boy? John, take your baby sister from your mother. Don't look like neither. You've got good sense. John took Delilah and sat down with her in the easy chair. His mother bent over Roy and held him still, while his father, carefully, but still Roy screamed, lifted the bandage, and stared at the wound. Roy's sobs began to lessen. Gabriel readjusted the bandage. You see said Elizabeth finally. He ain't nowhere near dead. It sure ain't your fault that he ain't dead. He and Elizabeth considered each other for a moment in silence. He came mightily close to losing an eye. Of course, his eyes ain't as big as yours, so I reckon you don't think it matters so much. At this, her face hardened. He smiled. Lord have mercy, he said. You think you ever gonna learn to do right? Where was you when all this happened? Who let him go downstairs? Ain't nobody let him go downstairs. He just went. He got a head just like his father. It got to be broken before it'll bow. I was in the kitchen. Where was John? He was in here. Where? He was on the fire escape. Didn't he know Roy was downstairs? I reckon. What you mean you reckon? He ain't got your big eyes for nothing, does he? He looked over at John. Boy, you see your brother go downstairs? Gabriel, ain't no sense in trying to blame Johnny. You know right well, if you have trouble making Roy behave, he ain't going to listen to his brother. He don't hardly listen to me. How come you didn't tell your mother Roy was downstairs? John said nothing, staring at the blanket which covered Delilah. Boy, you hear me? You want me to take a strap to you? No, you ain't, she said. You ain't going to take no strap to this boy. Not today, you ain't. Ain't a soul to blame for Roy's lying up there now but you. 
You, because you done spoiled him so that he thinks he can do just anything and get away with it. I'm here to tell you that ain't no way to raise no child. You don't pray to the Lord to help you do better than you've been doing. You're going to live to shed bitter tears that the Lord didn't take his soul today. And she was trembling. She moved, unseeing, toward John and took Delilah from his arms. She looked back at Gabriel, who had risen, who stood near the sofa, staring at her. And she found in his face not fury alone, which would not have surprised her, but hatred so deep as to become insupportable in its lack of personality. His eyes were struck alive, unmoving, blind with malevolence. She felt like the pull of the earth at her feet, his longing to witness her perdition. Again, as though it might be propitiation, she moved the child in her arms, and at this his eyes changed. He looked at Elizabeth, the mother of his children, to help me, given by the Lord. Then her eyes clouded. She moved to leave the room. Her foot struck the lunchbox lying on the floor. John, she said, pick up your father's lunchbox like a good boy. She heard behind her his scrambling movement as he left the easy chair, the scrape and jangle of the lunchbox as he picked it up, bending his dark head near the toe of his father's heavy shoe. Okay, now let's turn to the story at level one, and let's just outline what exactly it is that happens. As we get ready to do that, let's jump over to page 1088 real quickly with your cultural connection there in that, in that special box. Read it with me. James Baldwin in the church. Baldwin's choice of words and often the subject matter of his stories was influenced by the evangelical church of which his father was a minister. In this story, many details reflect this influence. For example, you have references to the good Lord and saints, references to the father as the reverend, mention of prayer services, the fact that the mother and her friend each call each other sister, conflicts between the family's strict religious values and the temptations of the neighborhood. As a teenager, Baldwin earned renown for his gifts as a preacher. He brought those same skills, uh, gifts, including the use of impassioned rhythmic language to his reading, creating prose of great beauty and power. And then obviously the question here to connect to literature, list two or three examples of Baldwin's rhythmic language in this story. I've had juniors that say, of all the professional readings that we've listened to, this is the very best one. A lot of that has to do with James Baldwin. This is his gift. He has the ability to write that almost like melodic. Did you notice this at times? It's almost like a form of rap, isn't it? The way it's almost like a melodic type of language that Baldwin can construct. Let's now go ahead at level one. If you walked out of 303 and somebody asked you, do what you study uh, you know, in 303 today, and you said, we did this story called Rock Pile by this cat named Baldwin. What's the story about? Can you reduce it to a <coughs> single sentence or two? What would you say about this story? Well, you might write down, it's a story basically about a kid who gets himself in trouble. But now upon further reflection, you would say, you know what? This story really isn't much about Roy going on the rock pile and getting jacked, is it? It's really a story about family. Would you agree with me? And this is the brilliance of this story. It starts out so simple. But then you start reading beneath the story at level two, and you realize there's something going on here within this family, isn't there? There's a mother who had a son named John, and it, we're, we're told in her days of sin, her perdition was the way it's recounted later. And then she will have several other children, including Roy, with this man who now is the father, Gabriel. There is a clear difference between the way these two sons are treated. Would you agree with me? Because, of course, John is just Gabriel's partial son, half-son, right? But Roy is his full son. And so you can see there's some tension going on there, which will now explain why at the beginning of the story, John was, first of all, afraid, but at the same time a little reluctant to, to narc or to tell on his brother. Clearly, you get the sense, right, without the narrator ever telling us, clearly you get the sense who is the favorite in the family, right? You see how it works? Clearly Roy is the, fa is the favorite. And so now all of a sudden you understand why it is the case that the mother, Elizabeth, is a little bit concerned when this happens. Like, oh, no, we're going to have heck to pay when dad comes home. Whereas earlier, maybe as a reader, you were like, I, I didn't understand why everybody was getting all wound up about this. The kid got jacked on the rock pile. Who cares? And then you've got this underlying thing happening within the story. 
All right, that's a level one reading. Let's jump to a level two A and messages themes here. We have a number of possible interpretations of this story at the thematic level. Let's list them. One, obviously we've got a dynamic about what goes on in families, especially when we are talking about relationships between <coughs> mothers and fathers and their children. And of course, we could say it this way, sometimes tension within the family manifests itself in interesting ways. Right? Another major theme of this story, of course, and often juniors will catch up on this one, is the question of do you tell, do you not tell? And why it is the case that John didn't just go in when Roy, when Roy was about to leave and go down and play on the rock pile and say to his mom, you just need to know that Roy's leaving to go play on the rock pile. Question, why do you think John doesn't do that? Answer, it's clear that he has a certain relationship with Roy by virtue of Roy's being the full father of Gabriel and Elizabeth and John not being there. So he feels somewhat trapped. So he can't really defend himself very well. Okay? Let's jump to 2B uh, really quickly and, and we ask as we, as we begin the story, what is the symbol of the rock pile? A symbol, we might say, of violence, a symbol of tension, a symbol of conflict. And of course you have two kinds of conflict going on in this story, don't you? You have the conflict of the rock pile, which is kind of a physical conflict, and then you've got the more subtle conflict going on within the family itself and the family dynamics. We can also at 2B pay attention to the brilliant way that Baldwin can construct a story that's so beautifully written that when it's read out loud, it almost has a certain kind of rap, uh, rapsoric kind of feel to it, the beauty of the language. Let's jump to 3A really quickly and talk about relationship to other titles. What is your movie that <coughs> outlines uh, the best for you, Tensions Within a Family? One of the titles we'll study in our junior year is um, uh, Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman, which plays the game of attention within a family, so you can write that one down. Is it the case that oftentimes family is the place where you learn how to not love but hate, how to not hug but fight? Is that true in the way in which the family that you've been raised in? Finally, at 3B, let's ask a personal or two questions so we can relate to this story. Do you have a story out of your own background that's somewhat similar? Do you have a story, for example, where something kind of insignificant was the cause of any number of effects? You know what I mean? This kind of <laughs> ripple effect that came all the way to the end of the story where for a moment, Gabriel looks at Elizabeth, we're told, with hatred. You can kind of sense there's something always seething right there underneath the surface. And a little insignificant story like this can kind of lead to it. And do, you have a, do you have a situation in your family life where something similar happened that you can jot down really quickly? How about this question? What is your thought about family? Is family the place where we learn how to love each other? Or is family the place where we learn how to jack each other? What's your thoughts on that? And question, is there such a thing as a perfect family? Is there such a thing? Or do you think all families have this dynamic tension within them? Finally, of course, there's always this question about being, an, being involved in a family. If you are a stepson or a stepdaughter, do you know at all the experiences of John? I've had juniors that read this story. They go, totally understand what's going on with John. My dad left us when we were young. My mom remarried, had several children with the new guy. And I was always kind of like a little bit on the outside looking in. And I always had to, I always had to kind of live and deal with this. In other words, I know exactly what... John is kind of living through and going and going through. Of course, Elizabeth has her issues too. She can tell that he wants to hold over her head an experience from the past when he talks about prior sin, that kind of thing, right? Notice um, um, on page 1089, he says to her, you think you're ever going to learn to do right? Right at the end, in other words, I can't, I can't believe that you allowed this to happen. You're, you're, still, you're still misbehaving. It treats her, treats her like a child, which makes you obviously kind of feel a certain way towards Gabriel, the father. Some have said they don't like him very much because they see him as domineering. Notice the very last line of 
the, uh, of the, of the uh, story brilliantly finishes as John reaches over to pick up the dropped lunch pail, look at it. He picked up the lunch pail, bending his dark head near the toe of his father's heavy shoe. So you get this really powerful sense that the kid's on his knees bending over to pick up the lunch pail, and he's right next to his father's, father, his stepdad's foot, right? And so you get this powerful image going on. Well, there you go, an introduction to James Baldwin's <coughs> brilliant work, uh, Rockpile. Thank you.